I'd like to introduce our newest sponsor, Swim Angelfish. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using Superior Swim Timing. You can use Superior Swim Timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with HiTech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. All right, Shannon Rolson, how you doing, mate? Yeah, good, thanks, Brett. How are you? Good, good. Uh, where are you coming from? Canberra, sunny Canberra. Canberra. Canberra, you're back in Canberra. What are you doing there? <laughs> uh, riding my bike, uh, coaching a few kids and uh, trying to stay out of trouble. <laughs> nice. Now, were you just up with the Aussies in, in camp? Yes, yeah, I was. So... Um, uh, off the back of the Olympic trials, I got uh, Jess Hansen made the team and um, I went up to Brisbane for a week. It was supposed to be two weeks, but um, after one week, uh, they decided it was best that we all get up into Cairns uh, because they were afraid of a, the Brisbane lockdown, um, which ended up happening that following day. So on the Monday, we went up to Cairns and, uh, and I did the second week up there and then left last Saturday. Who did you say you were coaching again? Jessica Hansen. Jessica Hansen. What's she swim? 100 breast straight. 100 breast. Okay. All right. Yeah, she got second um, second at the trials. So it was, it was a good performance. Good stuff. Her first Olympic team. Awesome, mate. Now, listen, how's the camp looking? How, how's the vibe up there? Yeah, it was good. Um, we, had, we had everyone in except for uh, a couple of groups that were in Townsville. Uh, and then they had to quarantine for a couple of days uh, and get a shot or get a test and, and get the clear. But uh, it was good. It was pretty relaxed. Um, certainly probably more relaxed than, uh, you know, it's been probably 10 years since I've been on Australian teams. And I, I felt it was a more relaxed than, than that. Um, and, uh, yeah, everyone's just sort of, you know, waking up and seeing what each day brings, which is yeah. sort of how we're, we're all living. It's very odd, isn't it? I mean, you've been part of many Olympic teams in the past. This one's different, man. I mean, the whole preparation for this and then even even in camp and and even in the lead up, you know, a couple of weeks out, we're, we're still hearing new things like there's not going to be any spectators in Tokyo now. They're, they've just thrown that on us. It's, it's pretty wild, the whole, 
the whole year, really, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, this time last year, you know, we weren't in the water um, and then we sort of get back and then how long were, were you going to be in the water? And, and then, you know, you had to sort of think about, you know, do I go to a competition and then it gets, you know, you become quarantined because you've been somewhere. And so you really had to think differently. Um, the good thing was probably a few more programs got to do some longer extended aerobic um, capacity type work, um, made about able to make some changes technically and things like that. But certainly, as um, as the trials loomed, um, you know, looking at my the preparation I had with my guys, we um, we had to start racing, and so you sort of uh, you were taking a bit of a chance. But um, anyway, it, it all sort of panned out. But um, talking to Jess just before I left in Cairns, you know, expect the unexpected, you know, um, and don't sort of go in with any preconceived ideas. And remember, you know, that no one's been in this predicament. You know, you might have been to Olympics before, but you won't have been to an Olympics like this. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's – it's strange. It's odd. I guess for the for the newcomers, for the ones that haven't been to Olympics, this is the first time. They don't know any different, so it's probably good for them. But but certainly the ones that have been to some before, it's going to be a challenge. Um, listen, mate, you're one of the world's leading coaches. Have been for a long time, you know. And and something like this kind of brings up the question of, you know, do you start reevaluating how you prepare athletes and and um, what you value and um, does it does it force you to look at ways that you can be better as a coach? You know, I'm sure you've had a system that has worked for you for a number of years. You know, probably in the early 2000s when things were clicking for you, it was like, oh, I'm just going to keep doing this because this works. Has there been a point recently where you felt like this is forcing some change on you or philosophically have you stuck to your guns? Yeah, I think, you know, to be successful over a long period of time in any given field, you need to be moving forward and evolving. Um, and certainly um, I've, that's something I've tried to do. Um, and the trick is bringing what's worked for you in the past and trying to adapt it to the people, the new people that you've got in front of you. Um but I think it does. I certainly think I was talking to Sean Kelly uh, a week ago and he was talking about, you know, because I thought the British had a great trials, swam really fast. Mm. And I was talking to him and, and I, I said, um, he, he said to me, he'd asked a few of the top coaches what, what they thought and they were sort of scratching their heads. But what they, they did say was a very long, uninterrupted preparation. And I think, you know, when I, I look back and, and it was something when I was at the AOS we were always talking about, you know, people say or swimmers say, you know, we have been training all year, but the actual fact is that is a rarity, um, if almost impossible, when you're looking at, uh, you know, injuries, illness, competitions, downtime before comp tapers, downtime after comps, you know, to get a good block of work uh, these days, or in the past has, has been so sometimes a challenge and um, because there's a lot of racing and people can earn, earn money from racing and things like that. So I think out, out of this will, will come some change and um, certainly uh, made me reflect on, on, particularly with swimmers that you're trying to develop, that you don't over-race them in those developing years so that they can get what they need at the age that they require it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting the the, the f philosophical development of, of kids, and you know, just today alone, um, I don't know when this podcast is going to come out, but today we saw a sixteen-year-old boy swimmer forty-seven three, and just blew my mind. Like everything I thought I knew about, you know. <laughs> Uh, development and sprinting, it just kind of felt like I just threw it all out the window watching that today. Did you get a chance to see him swim? Yeah, I did. I saw that uh, only yesterday. Um, the uh, That was in Italy by the looks of it, in Rome, yeah, I think, leading yeah. off a relay. Yeah. yeah, it was in Rome. And then today he he went the 100 freestyle and went 47.3, so he went faster. Oh, okay, he went quicker again. 
they went quicker uh, again. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, I, I, well, I watched the leadoff leg in the relay now. I think he was home in 7, uh, 24 5. And um, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, like uh, just when you think, and that's the great thing about sport, it's why we continue to do it and people continue to watch it. Um, it just throws up stuff. Um, you know, the Tour de France last year was won by a 21 year old, you know. Um, so. Uh, ignore youth at your peril, I think the saying is. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, in, in regards to that, in terms of the progression of, of sprinting, let's say, I mean, you had a lot of success with, with female sprinters, you know, um, namely Jody Henry and um, Alice Mills at the time, you know, back in the mid-2000, 2000, 2000, what, 2004, around, you know, that period of time. But I just saw the women in Australia, you know, I think they got four girls under fifty three in the in the hundred for the, for their relay. So how is it how has it gone from where it was when you were coaching Jody and Alice, where the fifty three mid to high was a very fast time, to now it's kind of just run of the mill, and and we got girls that are knocking on the door of fifty one, and certainly swimming fifty two lows quite regularly. How, how's that progression happened? Yeah, well. Um, I've caught up with Jade a couple of times um, recently and um, we were at a, uh, one of the sprint camps. must have been just before COVID. And, uh, yeah, the, the big difference um, is outright speed. You know, when you look at those girls um, compared to Jody, Jody was like a 24-8 swimmer. Alice was 4-4. Um, I think she went in 2005. Um, and these girls are swimming 23 points. Um, back end speed hasn't changed a lot. Uh, Jody was back in 7.2. A lot of, you can win a race coming home in that these days. So it's really front end. I think that the, you know, the training's evolved. Um, I, I focused a lot on, on back end training, um, particularly with Jody because that was a strength. And, uh, you know, um, Simon Cusack, I sort of know the work that he does, it, and it's 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 definitely yeah front end based. Um, but I think the blocks certainly help, you know, with the kicker um, and and just uh, you know technical advances and 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 not kicking too early out of starts and turns and things like that. Um, I, th I think the suits has is definitely plays a role. Um, Jody, Jody's, you know, we were having that conversation and Jody was talking about how tight the suits were back then. And, and, and Jode was tight, like Jode couldn't touch her toes. You know? <laughs> so that didn't help her start. And, um, and then you put on this tight suit, whereas now you can get the, you, you can get the tightness um, or, or the, the compression without the tightness. So uh, that certainly helps. Um, and... Um, the other thing with Jody's start was she had one one leg shorter than the other, so her hips were never facing forward. Um, so definitely a kicker would have helped her. Would it have helped her a whole second? I, d I don't think so. Um, but certainly, certainly those little things. And, and the other thing, Brett, is you know when when someone breaks a time, then people believe it can be done. You know, which was sort of that that was the big era back then. I mean. Um, when the girls won in 04, it was 48 years since Australia had won that race and they've won it three out of four Olympics um, since, you know. So so, um, so I think there's a, a couple of things that contribute to that. It'd be interesting, you know, if, if uh, Jodie was swimming today, whether she would have had to go out to the 200, and we've talked about that. Um, that was certainly an event that she was capable of doing. But I coached Penilla Bloom um, in uh, Denmark and Janetta Otterson, um, and, and both very good freestylers. Um, Penilla, very good swimmer. Probably from a freestyle point of view, the best freestyle I've coached um, apart from Jody. Uh, and, and the sort of sets that she could do were on par with what Jody could do. Um, but but had a bit more outright speed um, than Jody, obviously. And then, you know, she went on to win that 50, which 
which if you had have asked me in 2014, um, she was suing 24-5, then I wouldn't have thought that, you know, she could have done that. She's only my height. We used to argue about who was taller. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't seem like it didn't seem like anyone really had any firm money on her up until a couple of months out. You know, like the, I don't think anyone would have picked her to win that thing. You know, even weeks out. So that yeah. certainly was a surprise. But she's, you're right. Technically, she's beautiful. She sits really high on the water. She's obviously got good length for for a shorter person. You know, killer kick. She's got a lot of attributes, but she does have that top end speed. Um, is that something that you were working at the time? Like, you know, you said you, you focused more on back end, but had you shifted at some point because you had an athlete like that to focus more on the top end? Well, uh, leading into Rio, um, she was training with Stefan, um, who who's now the head coach in, in Denmark. So, um, and she wanted to focus on the, the 50. I'd come back to Australia um, Janetta Ollison and, and Rega Mala Pedersen were, were training with me and I went to Rio with them. But, you know, when, when, I, when I got to Denmark, um, Penilla was sort of training for the 200 free and um, had decided to stop swimming and I got it back in the water and, and just focused on, on the 100 uh, and we were looking at, you know, we had three very good uh, swimmers in, in the – breaststroke, fly, and, and backstroke, and, and I felt, you know, Penilla, if we could get her down to, um, you know, a 53-type swim, you know, that would be a great relays team for, a, especially for a small country. So that was where my focus was. So obviously I was trying to improve a 50, but always felt her 100, you know, was the event. Um, and, and she was swimming 53-5 uh, back then, I think, and, uh, you know, coming home in 27.5. So she's got a very good back end and, and you know, I certainly wouldn't um, disregard her if, if she's done enough work in, in, a, in a 100 freestyle. Yeah. Listen, when I was talking to um, Alice on the on the podcast, she was talking to me about your reverse periodization at the time. Is that something you're still doing and, or, and why did you do it and what's the advantages to it? You know, talk to me about it. Yeah, so... Um, that all started off uh, sort of I, I started just questioning um, what, you know, what I was doing, what, what sort of coach I wanted to be, how could I be different. Um, and uh, Jody and Ellis um, started training with me in 97. And this was sort of when I was uh, a young guy, um, Tim Carrison, mm -hmm. uh, he started working with me. He had a rowing background and, and no one wanted to work with him, a sports science guy. No one wanted to work with him in swimming because he didn't have a swimming background. And um, I used to ask a lot of questions, so, so probably annoyed at people, so they just threw him over with me and off we went for a couple of years. And um, I knew Jody was, like, just different. She was just, a, you know, Swam technically really well. Um, was young, and um, you know, I was co I had sort of a licorice all sorts club. I, I was on teams and things, but um, I, I was I had a turn of flyer, a fauna ammo, a sprinter, everything, and I just wanted to, um, yeah, just be different, really. And um, so I looked at I, I I I ran a bit when I was younger at school and had an interest in athletics and uh, looked at when they did their speed blocks. And I think you and I talked about it on buses in Germany somewhere um, back in the day, but I looked at when they did their speed blocks in athletics and they did it straight off the back of a major meet. And, and Tim Kerrison with his uh, rowing background, they just did lots of long, slow swimming, uh, rowing for their aerobic work. And so that's basically, I thought after 2000, I'm gonna, just going to do this. And if you're a distance swimmer, you're going to have to go somewhere else. <laughs> um, and, uh, and and that's you know that that's how it all kicked off. And um, and and I had a lot of people, a lot of coaches, a lot of really well respected coaches say, you know, don't do that, and you know just be patient and all that. And it was good advice, but basically, I just wanted to be different. And um, and I felt that. Uh, you know, I had some young, talented uh, swimmers in my program and, and um, 
when I looked around the world and looked at what Australia was doing, we just weren't fast enough uh, to be competitive uh, in, in the shorter distances. So, um, so after the, the the Olympic Games in two thousand, which I, I didn't get anyone on that team, Jody finished sixth, and um, she made the Commonwealth Youth Team, and uh, and I went up with her on that team, and then it was basically a four year project. I mean, one of the good things, and I haven't been able to do it since, is I just I had nobodies, um, so no one was expected to make teams and things like that. So I, I was just a free agent for a while, and I just put a four year plan in place. And we did the first year we just worked on the fifty. That's it. And then the second year, two thousand two, we started thinking about the hundred. And then the third year, it was a consolidation. Um, and then the you know the fourth year was the Olympics. So worked really well. Um, and from you know, if you're not familiar with reverse periodization, but you know the Jan Albrecht uh, European model, it's very similar to that, to be honest. Um, Have you had a chance to document yours? As you know, like we, we reference him, you know yeah. Jan Ulrich, but uh, why aren't we referencing you? Have you had a chance to document it all, and people can go and study what you did? Um. Probably, yeah, certainly not in, in that de- level of detail. I, I was asked to do a presentation with um, back in 2000 or end of 99 because I had a remember his girl, Julia Ham? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so Julia uh, trained with me and then um, left me, went to another program for about 18 months and then came back and um, she lost all her speed. And in that time... Yeah, Tim and I were talking about what could it look like. So she was actually my little guinea pig. Um, and uh, so I rolled it out with her first. And she went from like September 98, she was swimming 63 for 100 fly. She'd been 61 um, two years earlier or 18 months earlier. And six months went by, we got it back to 61. She made the World Uni team. And then we prepared for the World Unis in Spain for 99 and she won the silver in 60.2 mm. and i thought well oh, i think there's something in this so um uh i did a presentation on that and uh a few of the older coaches sent out faxes so that's how long ago this was and uh <laughs> said this was the the work of the devil and uh don't do it um and uh <laughs> <laughs> you know what it was like in Australia back then? Yeah, yeah. You open up a swimming book, it, it was only about the 1500. So, um, <laughs> no, no anyway, shit. the more people said don't, well, that was just, yeah, that, that was all I needed to keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but That's yeah, cool. I've talked about it. Um, I, I did, I've done a few talks in Britain and things like that. Um, you know, people who've come and, you know, spent time with me, you know, it, it, it's, I don't think it's a complicated situation. You know, you, if you want to swim a certain time for a hundred or two hundred or four hundred, you've got to be fast enough to swim that time, you know, because you've got to have that easy speed. So, all right. So, just simplify it for us then. How do you build? How would you build easy speed? Well, I mean, what are the things that you have to be doing to build easy speed? So you be technically very good, and right. you've got to be technically very good across all speeds. And that was really Jody's. Yeah. That's what Jody had. Like, you know, whether I she was swimming, you know, twenty ones on one thirty or 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 six thirty meter sprints, the 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 technique didn't alter. She, you know, she, she had constant kick. Um, her hip, her hip, you know, at a slow speed, she had minimal hip rotation. Um, she didn't have two or three different strokes for two or three different events. You know, yeah. so as she t- slowed. Uh, as, as she got tired, she just slowed down slowly. Mm. You, know, the, you know, I sort of say the person who wins the race is the person who slows down the slowest, not necessarily the fastest. Right. Um, so you want to slow down slowly. And um, and that's what she, she did really well. Um, you know, to, to start with, um, you've got to be able to pull. You, you sort of so you break break it down. You got to be able to be, be good at pull. You got to be able to um, not necessarily be the fastest kicker, but you got to have strong legs because if they break down, then the rhythm and, and the stroke breaks down. So I'm uh, 
you know, a very much a pull orientated freestyle model. Um, and uh, all my fastest swimmers have been very good at pull. And um, so we would do short 25s, 20s, uh, um, pulling, 50 meter pull. Um, and then we would, for, for our, as we got closer to, to the meet, we would, you know, do a 100 max pull. And, and I would expect them to be able to go 100 meter stroke rate plus probably two or three um, without fatiguing. Um, speed wise, you know, and I think uh, the girls might have uh, spoken a bit, a little bit about this, but you know, doing you know 25, 30 meter sprints on long rest walkbacks and doing like five, six of them, um, and then when when that sort of speed shifted, then we might go out to 35. When you sort of start getting out to 35 meters, you can start producing you know some good lactates and things like that. Um, yeah, if you're looking at lactate production work, um, particularly in freestyle and, and, and backstroke, less so in you know, breaststroke and flies probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, and then we would move out to 50s, you know. So, and to give you an example, off of, off of swim meet, you know, so say back in the day when Jody broke 26 for the first time, uh, we would come back and we would do like five sessions for the week. And we would try and go three. Yeah, the goal would be to swim under 26 handheld timing um, three times in the week. Mm. And, and we would try to do that for a block of, you know, four to six weeks if we could, you know. Um, and, and I got good buy-in. So it's one of the things with, with that sort of thing. You, you need dedicated people and they got to buy into that. Uh, and and over, over my career, I've been fortunate enough to, to have people that bought into into that. You know, they weren't looking to you know have a holiday straight off the back of of their major meet, um, be it Australian Championships or, or 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 trials or things like that. So obviously, if if you make a team, you know, that's why I was a big fan of you know um, having the trials and then sort of having a twelve or sixteen week prep because. I felt I could, you know, try and improve on that last preparation as well. So right, right. Let me uh, go back to one thing in terms of pull. How did you like to do your pull? Was it a, a paddles buoy and, and a strap around their ankles? Is that how you did it? Yeah. So um, Jody never never used paddles. So it's, I mean, it started off trying to use them, and she'd just get sore shoulders. She, right. she had great internal rotation. So. Um, so in her career, no paddles at all. Mm -hmm. um, and apart from that, it was like finger paddles, like uh, Alex Popov used to do a lot of that sort of finger yeah. paddle pull. Mm -hmm. So um, so that was about as big as, it, as they got. Um, and I would do band only for short distance work, um, wow. pull boy band for, for longer distance work. Um, um, yeah. I mean, I, uh, some swimmers can... You know, do band only and they can hold their body position quite well you know right. um what i wasn't trying to do is load them up technically poorly um if i felt they they needed you know if i wasn't happy with their technique with band only then they got a pull boy at, at the end of the day i was always trying to protect the technique so good point you just reminded me too that uh you say boy in australia we say we say buoy in america so sorry about yeah. that <laughs> through that no, no. <laughs> um, now in terms of building leg strength and endurance how did you go about that um is it just kind of kickboard you know all out kick for you like or what are you doing for that type of thing so the, the two types of kick is either all out fast work right or very long and uh um, continuous low heart rate type stuff. Try not to get caught in the middle. Um, so um, mix it up with sort of you know uh, a kickboard, no kickboard. Um, I, I'm a big fan of backstroke kick. Um, so I sort of try to mix it up. You know, if you're a freestyler doing uh, kicking on a with a board, um, and you can use a snorkel or not. Um, side kicking um, to Make sure that the glutes and the te technique of the kick. Uh, I see a lot of kids these days um, not kicking with good technique, you know, and they're not using their glutes. So, um, and their backstroke kick, I, I've just, um, you know, when you look back, you think uh, a lot of people were good at backstroke kick, you know, who, who were good at freestyle kick. So, 
And I remember talking to Doug Frost about that. But Ian Thorpe did a lot of uh, kick on his back as well. So just mixing it up like that, but long and steady, mm-hmm. not, um, you know, uh, do a bit of mentor coaching. Uh, and, and when you look at programs, you know, they'll be working on Monday and say that they've done a threshold set Monday afternoon or something like that. And then Tuesday morning they come in. I said, all right, so what do you do on Tuesday morning? Oh, we go kick. I said, oh, is it fast kick? No, no, it's just um, a kick on 150 cycle or, sorry, 140 cycle. How far would you kick? Oh, like two kilometres. And I'm thinking, geez, they they must be really good kickers because um, doing hundreds kick on 140, their heart rate would be quite high, wouldn't it? And, you know, when we sort of sit back and look at the, the week, they say, oh, I think I'm just hitting them all the time. I'm like, yeah, I think you are. So, so um, yeah, I, I sort of use the catchphrase sneaking up on fitness um, and that's where you need time. And uh, so you want to slowly get fit so that you're not damaging those white fibres and, and the speed work. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I like it. And, and I like the fact that you said, you know, you – went against the grain and, and tried something completely different and new. And I, and I kind of had kind of that same epiphany myself um, a few years back with, with sprinting. You know, I looked at track and, and I thought like, like to me, everybody was doing the same thing. You know, you're doing yeah. nine to 10 workouts in the pool. You're doing three lifts. You know, you're doing so many kick and pulls. You're doing, you know, so many speed workouts. It didn't seem like there was a wide variety around the world it's and to me i'm like are we doing something wrong here like should we just be flipping this thing on its head and um you know i think i've come down to australia and done a presentation on kind of what i thought about in terms of speed and building speed and and i, I still don't know if it's completely right or completely wrong you know i just know that i was like you i just wanted to do something different um are we at that point now? Like, how do we get to the next level? To me, it seems like everybody's still doing the same things that we were doing 30 years ago. There's not that much variability, but and yet we want to get faster. People are certainly getting faster, but we, we still want to get to the next level. Like, I can't wait to see a woman, a woman swim 50 point in the 100 free. I can't wait to see a guy swim 45 in the 100 free. I mean, that didn't seem like a possibility 20 years ago. But if we keep doing the same work that we were doing 20 years ago, it, it may not be. So do you think like that as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where, like, in 2000, um, you know, so I mentioned, you know, 99, I sort of rolled that out with in the 98 with Julia Ham, and um, I didn't have the guts to, mm. to, to do it with the whole squad. But then when I didn't get anyone on the team in 2000, um, you know, you know, they say, you know, millionaires have got to um, lose all their money before they, you know, really mm. take chances or something like that. Yeah. You know, for, so for me, I'd hit rock bottom, you know, mm. and um, and I just went, stuff it, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. And mm. uh, and people, it, it, and even Tim Kerrison said, oh, you, you'll ruin the club. Like, um, and I went, oh, I don't care. <laughs> and uh, anyway, everyone was wrong because the club just w- went from strength to strength. Um because when you looked at the events, most of the events are 200 and down. So if, if you've got a club that are good at 50s, 100s and the odd 200, then you're going to have a strong club. And, um, and, and that's what happened. One of the things back then is we were doing stuff and no one knew. You know, like the internet now is, has completely changed it. So, right, yeah. So we did what what we were doing didn't get out until after Athens. So I had four years of bliss, and and it was a you're looking back, it was a great period in time that you could do things, and the whole world didn't know about it. And I think today everyone is doing the same thing because everyone's seeing what everyone's doing, and then it, it makes it harder to step outside. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, and then and and it maybe those guys who are trying to step outside. That, you know, their swimmers are posting what they're doing. So then, you know, where's the advantage come from? So so I think, yes, there, there does need to be a shift 
Um, because if everyone's doing the same thing, you're just banking on that someone with more talent is going to walk through your program than the bloke down the road. Yeah. Um, so, and that's where I felt I had to give my try and give my swimmers an advantage um, by doing something different. So, I think today's climate it's harder to get that advantage, but I certainly think it's probably is what is required. Uh, and then, and, and then you know, uh, swimming. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the hard things, you know, particularly when I was at AOS and stuff, people are after and, and these high performance um, programs. People are after results. Mm. Are you allowing those coaches the freedom to explore to get a big result? Or, mm. uh, or are the KPIs for that program restricting, um, you know, that program's um, advancement in, in coaching? So, so that's probably the challenge, and I think that's where you need um, you need brave coaches, but you also need brave employees um, to allow those people to explore. Um, one thing I think with men's sprinting, I think that. Yeah, it's funny. We just mentioned that young sixteen-year-old boy. You know, uh, the last sort of two years, people have talked about it, and, and I, I think that we need to look, you know, from a body shape point of view, we need to look back to the eighties, where, you know, I recently looked at the the men's hundred free in eighty-eight, and uh, you know, they they look like there's a there's a bunch of basketballers behind the blocks. Yeah. You know, Biondi mm-hmm. and and uh, Borges, um, Gustavo Borges. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Brazil and and those guys and Mikel Gross and stuff and they were these tall, long, lean. So I think maybe that might be something to look for um, in the next um, leap forward. You know, um, yeah. The question comes to mind. You know, what would a Matt Biondi do today if he could do forty-eight four back then? And you look at his start, and it was a jackknife. I think the guy was about six foot seven. And he came up at the six meter mark. So, you know, um, what would that type of swimmer swim? And um, so, you know, sport sort of swings and shifts, doesn't it? So, you know, certainly looking at that young fella goes forty seven three. Um, that's the sort of body type that looks like, you know, that could progress. In my my view, anyway. No, listen. I think I think you're right. I think um, I I would agree with that. I think we need to kind of head in that direction when we bring those, you know, different type of athletic specimens into our sport. I think we've lost them in the past, and and I think yeah. we need to bring them back. Um, now that being said, Bruno Fratus I think is one of the fastest swimmers in the world, and he's uh, you know six foot one, and um, you know I'm not going to tell him that he can't win the Olympics in a couple of weeks. So I'm just going to oh, run. No. Out. I'm gonna run with that, but uh, but yeah, I know. Look, I know what you yeah. mean. You know, uh, for sure. Yeah, there, there's definitely. Yeah, I mean, time. Penilla Bloom is 171 or 172, depending yeah. on whether you ask her or ask me. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And like that girl can sit on top of the water and just smoke. You know, so yeah, uh, yeah. It's you couldn't drown her if you tried. <laughs> That's true. No, look, I think I think in terms of that, I think. I think COVID in a way has been good for swimming because I think it forced a lot of people to um, make some changes, whether they liked it or not. You know, a lot of people were locked out of pools and I was one of them, uh, you know, during LA, I was in LA when there was just a complete lockout and we had to get super creative and, and I've always been a creative coach anyway. So for me, that was kind of fun, but I think it really forced a lot of coaches into being creative. And I think, some of our next advancements may have come out of this COVID situation where, um, you know, programs have really shifted from doing what they've always done to figuring out, okay, we're in this position now. How am I going to get my athlete ready? And, and look, we're still seeing, you know, times all around the world drop, you know, and, and everybody's been in this kind of lockdown situation for a while. So there, there must have something must have come out of this that is going to advance our sport. I must believe that, you know, and I, and I think for me, there's certainly some things that I looked at where I was like, Oh, wow. And I was lucky enough to coach a guy, you know, Cody Simpson, you know, him and the impact that he's had in Australia. And, and here's just a, 
here's a kid who um, hadn't swum in years and he was just like, make me faster. And it was during COVID. So for me, it was like, okay, well, let's get creative. And we got super creative and he got faster. So, you know, that's just one example of where um, I think a lot of us have been forced into this um, situation of shifting our ideas on how to get um, endurance and strength and speed and athleticism you know, we're, we've really had to analyze it in a different way, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, you know, it, it, I, I think, you know, as a coach, you've got to, always got to have a questioning mind, you know. So whether, you know, the swimmer swims well or swims poorly, too often coaches only ask the question why something happened when they swim bad. But you have to understand why something happened, more importantly, I think, when they swim well right and and as you say there's been a lot of fast swimming um and a lot of people have had have had different preparations and been forced into mm -hmm. time off and you know that sort of goes back to those sort of you know the times back in the 80s and you know, as a kid growing up in brisbane queensland you know there wasn't many winter pools around so so you you didn't train full time through winter and mm -hmm. uh so and, and you know through that, I think, through this whole COVID thing, what can we take away from it? I think, you know, the best coaches will be asking those questions. And through, um, I think the other thing is, you know, when you're talking about creativity, like it was interesting, you know, when I went to Denmark, you know, we didn't have all the bells and whistles of the AIS. And um, I, I was, you know, much more creative there um, in, in trying to, maneuver around right. um, some of the things that we didn't didn't have and um i think sometimes we look for things to be too perfect mm. and then we sort of start falling asleep and then you know something like COVID happens and then you were probably at your most creative you'd been for a few years because out of necessity isn't it so 100 percent, yeah absolutely through necessity comes creativity yeah yeah you're forced into it i agree i agree um Listen, tell me, what are you doing with uh, New South Wales and, and New South Wales Swimming? Are you involved in that now? Yeah, so I'm employed by New South Wales. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm based here in Canberra. So basically we're trying to keep kids in the sport um, initially here in Canberra. And then um, uh, an we're an avenue for a lot of country kids. So in my program, I've got some country kids from, you know, places like Orange, um, yeah. Yeah, um, those sorts of areas um, that can come in. Um, I've got a boy from Sydney who, who's strong with me for the last sort of eighteen months. So basically, any, anyone in, in that New South Wales area can can swim with me. Um, and yeah, so sort of, that was back in the day at AIS. We, we were a, a, you know, a good avenue for country uh, swimmers in in Australia to be able to come in, and and it wasn't too big of a step from country areas. You know, going to your big cities like Sydney and, and Melbourne and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of a stopgap like that. Um, and then I do a bit of mental coaching with coaches who, who, who want to be involved with that. Um, we do some camps and um, just trying to get the, the state um, back on its you know, feet, so to speak. And, um, you know, over, over the last probably decade, there's been a, a lot of swimmers, you know, leave – New South Wales and, and head to Queensland um, and we've got to try and, you know, provide uh, an opportunity for that not to happen um, and in doing so I think the country will be better for it as well. Mate, when I grew up, you know, the inner city programs, like I grew up in Maroubra, you know, yeah. and it was thriving. I mean, we had so many Olympians coming out of that area. Why do you think that that has disappeared so much like why isn't there top athletes coming out of the city of sydney i mean there's so many people there it's there's so many pools there it's surrounded by water and ocean um you know a lot of money like why isn't there more going on in the hub of sydney yeah so i think yeah it's a good question and uh as many things it, it's not just one thing so um if you go back you know, when I was um, at the AIS, 
yeah, a lot of the mantra back then um, was to go to Queensland. Mm. Uh, and so you had a lot of Sydney, um, good Sydney, New South Wales swimmers head to Queensland. Um, and then that sort of, uh, you know, I went over to Denmark in 2013, but I think that sort of continued to happen. So yeah, Emma McKeon's went to Queensland and, and, and swimmers like that. Um, so that's one respect. The other thing that, um, yeah, back, as you say, in the 90s, I remember, you know, the coaches that were Sydney-based back then and, and you know, you, you could have almost picked an Olympic team just on those coaches. So um, so there was good opportunity. A lot of those coaches have, have um, you know, retired. And uh, so the young crew that, that have come through haven't – when you lose your top swimmers, you, you know, the thing in Australia is you don't keep developing as a coach. So, right. you know, the discussion we've had uh, of the last um, sort of 18 months is how are our coaches going to get the um, the experience that they need because you need your coaches to have more experience than, you, than your athlete or, or you're always, you know, striving for that. And... Um, so we we got to get New South Wales coaches overseas, seeing what a world championships looks like. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough. Like my my first uh, Australian team was the Mayor Nostrum in 1995. Yeah, so when I went to the Olympics in 2004, I'd been on on Australian teams for eight years. Um, you, you certainly don't want to be heading off to your first Olympics as your first team as a coach. So, um, you know. COVID sort of put the handbrake on that a little bit, um, but let's hope those things will change in the future and, and we can get a, a group of coaches overseas and looking at what good swimming looks like. What what does world-class swimming look like? And it's certainly, when I went into Denmark, um, Danish coaches hadn't been at international meets for a decade because of the two coaches that were in previous to me had they didn't have um, Danish assistant coaches, so 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 that therefore there was this gap uh, in the system, and we certainly went about changing that. And I think the same things happened in in New South Wales, and we just you know things take time. We got to first off, we got to retain our our best swimmers in New South Wales, um, and that way that'll help the coaches. You know, go on that journey with those athletes. Um, so, and then, you know, I think the other thing, Brett, is is, um, and this is this will happen as cities get bigger. You know, tra- you know, transportation and, and getting around. You know, like when Matt Abood came and swam with me in two thousand sixteen, he couldn't believe how much time he had on his hands. You know, um, it's hard to be an athlete. Uh, in a big city, I believe, um, because if you're sitting in traffic for 40 minutes one way, you know, there's yeah. two and a half, three hours, you, you know, you could be doing something more productive. So I think, you know, that needs to be addressed and, and that'll happen in Brisbane as well. You know, when I was coaching in Brisbane, you know, Tani White came from Redcliffe to swim with me at Chandler. Now, that just can't happen today so yeah so i think you've got to you've got to be strategic and where you're placing some of your your best programs um so that there's good access um and uh then we've got to provide you know learning opportunities f- for the for the next crop of coaches coming through um and and for that that's that means getting overseas and 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 looking and talking to people um that's something that i've you know, I, I probably wasn't that um, wary of at the time, but I look back and I go, oh, I was so fortunate to be just rubbing shoulders with people with a lot more experience than me and getting to see the likes of the world's top swimmers up up and close. So, Well, I appreciate the answer, yeah. Um, one of the things that was challenging for me when I was growing up in New South Wales and Sydney, you know, was this gap between – being an age group swimmer and then, you know, making it to the national team, you know, making it to the open team. Yeah. And for me, it was obviously this, this 
positioning where I could go to America, you know, and, and fill that gap. And it worked well for me. And I, I still see the same challenge being faced in Australia. Like there's no real answer for that gap between high school and making the open team. And, and I was a little bit of a late developer. So it took me years to get there. It wasn't something that was going to happen at 19 or 20. Uh, is there still that issue there in, in Australia? Um, well, I think there is, you know, not so much in Queensland. I think there is certainly, again, that 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 is one of the problems in New South Wales. We're losing, if we don't lose our best swimmers to, to Queensland, we're, we're losing them to America. And I'm a big believer in um, upward pressure. So, you know, if, if you're going to change, um, you know, the standard of swimming, you need upward pressure because then human nature, people go, oh, well, I've got to train harder, or I've got to do a better job, or I've got to do whatever, I've got to go faster. So, um, and that's where, you know, my program in Canberra, we're trying to provide, uh, certainly provide a um, an alternative to going to America or going to Queensland, um, just like, you know, a lot of the programs are. So, you you need good access to universities um, so that uh, the athletes can keep developing as, as people and learning uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, you know, Jessica Hansen, who's, who's Melbourne swimmer, um, you know, a year out from, from the, the trials, she moved to me uh, last August and she's working 22 hours a week with um, uh, PwC Price Waters Coopers, something yep. like that. So, um, yeah, and she wouldn't be able to do that. She couldn't do that certainly in Melbourne, and she wouldn't be able to do that in Sydney. But she she can get on with her life outside of swimming, and that that's been a great strength for her um, uh, to to do. So that's I think, um, yeah, as you said, you, you got an education, and, and I think it's all for that. You know, no one wants to hold anyone back. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think for Australia, with our proximity to the world, we need to make sure that our domestic competition is as strong as we can and we can't there, then afford to be losing people either, whether it's to Queensland um, yeah. or, or to the States, really. Um, so especially our better swimmers because they're the swimmers that are going to pull everyone up. Does that is make sense? It, is it not the answer to pump some money into like a Sydney Uni program or a Uni of New South Wales program and, and start up a, a college team of some sort where we're filtering athletes in to, you know, get an education, live in the city? Because I didn't want to live in Canberra, man. I'm sorry. I, oh, yeah, no. no. I didn't <laughs> want to go there. You know, so like why? Canberra's why not, not for everyone. Can, yeah. Can we not do that? Like jack up a, a, a couple of Uni teams in Sydney? Well, I think, yeah, they're trying, but yeah, certainly um, I think, you know, and I've, I've had these discussions with, with people, you know, I, I sort of refer to it, we've got a, a hole in the boat and we've got to, we've got to plug this hole, otherwise we're just yeah. going to keep sinking. Yeah. Um, and maybe, you know, there needs to be something done in the short-term interim, maybe for this Olympiad, where, where that does need to happen. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, I'm not the guy that um makes those calls but i've certainly aired my concerns to you know um people in uh, above me in new south wales and also australian swimming you know and i was on a high performance um workshop a couple of months back and, and i i just i made it known that you know new south wales was probably going to lose four to five of its best swimmers to overseas um mm -hmm. and you know that's domestically. That's just that. It just can't happen. Really, can't happen. Yeah, can't no. happen. No, our population is just not big enough to be losing that. You know, um, and, and 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 like anything, when people start to see those things, and people start to see, oh, you go to Queensland if you want to be good, or you go to the states, then it it becomes the normality. You know, without people actually. Yeah, you, know, you give me you give me a world class coach at Sydney Uni or, or, or Uni in New South Wales and you give me a guarantee that I can get into school and study, I mean, there's your answer. You're not going to lose 
yeah. most of those kids. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're going to want to stay in Sydney. They're going to they, – you can get me in school. Okay, I'm going to school. You can even give me a little scholarship of some sort to pay for some of my school. Great. I don't need to fly to America to get that now. Now yeah. I can just stay right here and get it. To me – and look, I'm on the outside. I haven't been back in 15 years, so don't don't think that I have the answers. But to me, it seems like an answer, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. We, um, you know, and everyone's trying. Um, and and there's certainly been progression. Like um, 2016, you had two swimmers on the Olympic team, and I think we've got five this time. Um, and, and nearly got a, a sixth swimmer, Sean Champion, um, Amanda Isaac, coaches so so it's moving in the right direction um but yeah for me it can't happen fast enough you know because um you know uh, i've got a young swimmer who's been to the states come back uh had a great olympic trials made the world unis team and and she's um she's due to go back to america you know and yeah yeah you know, she's you know fourth um in the country in two events and finalists in, in three different strokes and those types of swimmers we, we can't afford not to be around because they're you know the young kids need to look up to those kids as well you know um so yeah we've definitely got to plug the hole in the boat that's for sure well, who's the man we've got to talk to chris fidler is, is fides uh Fides the man. Fides, we need some money. You swam at Sydney Uni, Fides. Come on, mate. Pump some money into these programs and let's get these things going. I mean, to me, that's the only answer to keep kids in New South Wales and get it going again. Um, it just seems much more viable. And that's what I wanted. I just wanted a program where I could go and study and yeah. didn't have to pay, you know, a fortune to go to school and and just be part of a great team. To me, it just seems like the logical answer. So anyway, I'll get off that. But um What's next for you, mate? Where, where, what's going on in the next? Uh, let's let's have a look at Paris. Like, what what are you aiming for for the next three years? Yes, so it, it, we're in it, aren't we? Like, um, yeah, not that far the, away. The Olympic trials is less than three years away. So, yeah. um, so uh, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see like who decides to swim on after the, these Olympics. You know, I right. think um, you know. You could get people that may may have given it away who are sort of thinking, well, if I do something a little bit different, I might go um, and earn a bit of money swimming at World Cups or, or yeah. the ISL. Uh, and uh, then I'm two years out, you know, so I think that'll be interesting. Um, you know, I'm probably, you know, looking at my my guys that, that didn't make the team, I'm certainly going to try and use this winter as a technical uh, improvement, um, try and strengthen up some of the areas that need to be strengthened uh, from a, an aerobic point of view, but technically make some changes um, and hopefully not get shut down in the meantime, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, and then we got Commonwealth Games Worlds next year. Um, and probably by the end of the year, that will sort of have a bit more of an idea of who's swimming on, who's not, or who's having a gap year. Um, because then, you know, the, the people who are sort of in that fourth, fifth, sixth, they're the people that can jump up in um, – we need those people to jump up next year. And then if we can retain some of those older athletes, and this is something I think that the American uh, program's done really well over the last decade or so, they've enabled their swimmers to go off to Europe, um, swim in something a little bit different. The older athletes have brought the next generation through and then come the Olympic – trials there's a big fight for, for positions and and when you can when you can get that going that's when you start to see some special things you know building that upward pressure um retaining the older athletes and then let them go for it in the olympic year so i think that's that's sort of what australia needs in the next three years we need people to jump up um and look look at that opportunity next year because they could you know Fingers crossed there could be a lot of opportunity and a lot of racing in, in the next 12 months with the Commonwealth Games, World Champs. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, Aussies have always, uh, always needed more racing, but it does seem like there's a mini revival going on. There's certainly some buzz around some athletes and, you know, some, some relays that are coming up here in the next few weeks. I think Australia has a good shot to do really well in Tokyo and kind of build that momentum again. It seems like swimming is 
got a good feeling about it again back home. Uh, that's just the sense I get, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think the trials was quicker than what people anticipated. Yeah. It was a long preparation, like, um, you know, and, and you had to sort of tr try and really time that. Um, but looking at it, yeah, it was probably a little bit stronger depth-wise than what people thought um, it could have been. Um, I think the Olympics is going to be, yeah, it, it's going to throw up some odd results, you know, I would think, you know, can you swim, who can swim fast without a crowd, you know? Because yeah. we all know that there's people that lift because of the atmosphere. Yeah. Now we're going to see who can lift without the atmosphere. Um, uh, so that'll that'll be different. I think, you know, as I mentioned before, the British swam really well. That men's under free. <laughs> wow. Wouldn't miss that yeah. race. That's, yeah. That's, that could be epic. Cracker. Yeah. Yeah. It's shaping up real well, isn't it? I can't wait for that now. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's going to be some going to be some good racing. So yeah. I mean, it's always a good good time. Uh, Good time of the year whenever the Olympics roll around, mate. So, uh, listen, mate, I appreciate this. This has been fun. Uh, good to catch up again. Um, certainly not everything we could have talked about, but I appreciate you sharing a lot of detail there. So thank you very much. Yeah, no, thanks, Brett. Uh, enjoy the what you're doing, and it, it's great to have, um, you know, swimming swimming chat out for people to, to listen to. Mate, they're eating it up in America. I'm doing a lot of Aussie stuff, and they're they're loving it. So I uh, appreciate you sharing. I'm trying to get some American stuff on here too for you guys to enjoy. So uh, I think the thing that I love about this is I'm catching up with some old friends and kind of recording history at the same time. So it's it's nice, mate. You know, I think I think we can look back on this stuff. And man, even even today when I spoke to the young uh, 16 year old uh, David uh, Popovich after his um, record breaking swim he told me that he watches the podcast and he listens to all the top coaches and all the top athletes so i'm like okay like people are using this as a learning tool as well so um, yeah. everything you talked about today i'm sure people will be taking a lot of notes on doing some investigating and challenging new ideas so um appreciate it mate take care all right yeah no you too brett and uh catch up soon yep thanks shannon all right see you mate thanks mate